Welcome back to The Streets Won't Forget with Cali. Today, I am having a conversation with Andy Grant. Andy is a local lad from Liverpool like myself. He has got his own podcast called The Legget Podcast. He's got two other podcasts called The Legget Sportscast and The Legget Lifecast. Andy is also a world record holder, a dad, an ex-Royal Marine, an author of the book You'll Never Walk, which we'll get into in the podcast and a motiv- motivational speaker where he travels the country and the world sharing his story, which is a harrowing one. Andy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, mate. Cheers. <laughs> no worries. Um, before we get into it, we've had some sad news. Jürgen Klopp's leaving Liverpool. What are it, your initial thoughts on that? It ain't more than getting blown up there <laughs> in that news this morning, lad. <laughs> my God, I'd rather get blues with the leg, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but no, God, I think it's going to... Um, be something I've spoken about for weeks and yeah, weeks and months now. But yeah, initial news just complete shock. Yeah, I was all revved up for the podcast. I was like, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna come in with boss energy. I had a black coffee and I was like, yeah, gonna, gonna, gonna probably perform well. And I just feel like I've been cheated on. Nah, lad, we'll, we'll crack on, lad. We'll, we'll push through. But yeah, no, lad, it's, it's absolutely devastating. It's um, complete shock. But he's, a, he's the hero, isn't he? Yeah, he's the it, ultimate hero. For I think us. just because I think as Liverpool fans as we are, you know, go to the match and stuff, it's. I think for most of our kind of life, yeah. we've lived in the shadows of United. Yeah. And it's only these being this past kind of six, seven years, really, since mm. he's been here and he's put a stamp on the team that you felt that we've had something that could rival those glory days yeah. that Man United had. And the fact it's getting cut short just because he's... I mean, we're being selfish, aren't we, really, by yeah. wanting him to stay. Listen, he's, he's given everything we've... We, he's given us everything we've ever wanted as fans, hasn't he? Yeah. So... So it's, uh, yeah, we can't, can't moan too much. It'd be grateful, I think, is the probably yeah. the message. You've just got to feel grateful that we've had them. Start building the statue now. <laughs> no, it's yeah. outside the ground. Um, a lot of the stuff that we see on social media, it, it, we see, like, obviously you've got your podcast and the stuff that you share on your personal one as well. Um, but before we start getting into the book, just how you doing generally? I'm all right, you know, yeah. yeah. I uh, I always think it's a funny one when you mention social media, like I... I hate it in so many ways. Yeah. But it's just a necessary tool, isn't it? Yeah. In the way we live now and the way of businesses as well. Yeah. And and even just in some sort in some sort of, you know, social circles with friends and stuff. But I just hate and I do it myself that you're always constantly kind of almost keeping up with the Joneses or you're just being nosy. Yeah. Or you're just getting, you know, getting looking through so many reels that are just some some of them are funny, some of them are interesting. Some of them are proper funny though. Some of them are hilarious. <laughs> and they send you down mad rabbit holes and stuff and um so I hate how, what it takes away and just the whole, and just the kinds of, it's a lot of it is, is rubbish and, and kind of and bullshit, you know what I mean? A lot of it. Um, yeah. So I do hate a lot of it, but it's a necessary evil. So, so what I've tried to do in, in my own well being is just to kind of keep off a little bit. Yeah. Um, I've been in the gym a bit more. It sounds cliche with the new year, new me. Yeah. Tried to knock the, knock the booze on the head a little bit, get in the <laughs> gym a bit more. But yeah, I'm, I'm good, mate, doing a few motivational talks this month, which has been good. Um, in schools and in businesses and yeah, can't complain. Boss, boss, I think it's too late to ask you about your Christmas so I'll just move on. It's like <laughs> the end of Jan. I think you get two weeks, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Asking people about Christmas. So I wanted to do this podcast a little bit differently so instead of just like every other podcast where you go, to, like tell me about your life and mm. then you just sit there and listen. You've actually wrote a book about your life up until a couple of years ago when you wrote, when you finished it and I've reread it. It's a boss book. Again, you'll never walk if you're watching it's a great book it's about your story it's about well in fact i don't need to say what it's about i'm going to read for context the back page and just go from there if that's okay with you yeah is there anything in here that you don't want me to ask you about no anything mate, yeah anything. open book yeah it's out in the public so yeah <laughs> i thought you'd be all I've right i've actually so. got signed copies to be fair at home as well so if anyone wants one they can message me i'll be able to send a sign one out easy plug easy plug i'm sure this podcast will help you promote that book as no, well cheers, mate. Um, so for context the back page reads when Andy Grant awoke from a 10 day coma in a hospital bed he had a broken sternum, two broken legs, a broken elbow shrapnel lodged in both forearms he had a severed femoral artery sustaining nerve damage to his hands his feet as well as facial injuries he'd been blown up in a, in a during a routine foot patrol in Afghanistan a doctor told him that he would never have children. Just that is fucking like captivating as a, in just one paragraph, isn't it? Hmm. Um, doesn't even feel like me. It doesn't not feel like you. I think because I tell that story as well so much and 
when I do the motivational speaking, you sometimes it becomes like a like I'm an actor reading a script. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I've done it that many times, or sometimes it loses the emotion in it. So when you hear someone else say it, it's just it's just like, wow, is that me? Is that, yeah. Does that really happen to me? It's because it's an it's a fucking unbelievable story, though, isn't it? It's like the out of the things that you wish you, you think that could ever happen to you in your life, mm. that is not even on the map, is it? It's, it's no. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's been it's been so crazy, but you know what? I wouldn't change any of it though. You know, for anyone who reads that, it sounds like so, like my life's been probably so hard, and it's been you know so sad at times. But yeah, it's also you know allowed me to have so many amazing opportunities in life, and I've got such a unique mindset, I guess now. Yeah, just because of all that I've been through, so as kind of tough as it was, and don't get me wrong, there were some really tough times. There's been some amazing times as well. Do you know what I mean? And I, I'm I'm just so grateful for for the journey I've been on. It's and again, without sounding too she- cheesy, I hate the idea of being a sheep in life as well. Do you know what I mean? And just yeah. having like a normal, boring life. I yeah. think the fact that I've had something quite interesting happen, I kind yeah. of... Yeah, it's one way to be different. Like, yeah, it? it's, <laughs> I've kind of tried to own it if I can, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so going back to that that moment, you, you start the book off where you're talking about going and making the decision to amputate your leg because of your injuries. Just talk us through the feelings of initially waking up from that coma like what what were your initial feelings straight away from waking up and thinking where the fuck am i well straight away i knew i'd been blown up and i say that because the guy uh, my best mate who got blown up at ian he doesn't remember a thing about the whole the whole incident he remembers going to sleep in afghanistan and he wakes up and he doesn't know what's going on whereas i knew i'd been injured and the first thing i remember is waking up in an intensive care ward in birmingham and my dad was walking towards me and then I just burst out crying and I was just so relieved to see him and just so happy that he was there and I, I hugged him for what seemed like an eternity and I just kept on saying I'm sorry because uh, my mum died when I was 12 so he's brought me up and I just thought you know he's been sitting next to a hospital bed watching me in a coma for, for however long and I just felt this tremendous guilt that you know that's mad, isn't it? My dad's like a proper old school fella. He's not the type that, you know, you see in the movies, they're sitting there, you know, <laughs> yeah. touching your hand, reading me the, you know, yeah, the, the sports yeah. pages. Like, he he will have just been beside himself, probably going off for a ciggy a hundred times a day and, you know, feeling a bit awkward and stuff. And, you know, I can imagine the nurses saying, you know, you can talk to him, you know, my dad's like, what the fuck am I going to say? So yeah. I just felt really guilty. That means dad had obviously, I've put my dad in this situation. But then straight away, just relieved that, you know, I was alive, relieved that Ian was alive, I'm just grateful for all these doctors and nurses that were around me. And then it was more so in the days and weeks that followed because I was on that much drugs, you know, for pain relief. Mm-hmm. It was only the next few days I realised, like, the full extent of my injuries. And that's when the kind of, you know, the severity of the situation comes comes to it. Yeah. And I guess the hardest bit of the whole the whole that, which was, which is interesting to know that I'm talking about on a podcast because for years I never, never spoke about it. And it's only when I put it in the book that I'm more okay opening up about it. And that was when I got told I'd never be able to have kids. Mm-hmm. And I remember that day, like it was yesterday, you know, that was one of the saddest days of my life. Yeah, They didn't tell me at first that I'd lost um, the, the ability to have kids. They just mentioned all the other injuries. And the reason they didn't want to tell me too much is because I was going in for surgery every other day. And then it was only a few days um, after a particular surgery um, that it became apparent. And I just broke down. My dad had to come back in the evening um, outside the visiting hours and comfort me. And I think it was the fact that, you know, there was just nothing anyone could do. You know, sometimes if you broke your leg, they can say, look, the early options with me is, you know, you, you, you're unable to have children. And it was just such a big blow, which which then, if in a way, created a bit of a weird thing over the next weeks, months and years, because everyone always assumed that losing my leg was the was the worst injury where it, for me it was always not being able to have kids and mm-hmm. it was absolutely heartbreaking to know that you know one minute you're this big rough tough raw marine commando with the rest of your life heavier the next minute you know your dad's spoon feeding you you're getting told that you're not going to be able to run again you've lost your career you can't be a dad so it was yeah it wasn't the greatest couple of weeks ever i've ever had it's not just one thing is it it's it's like a, a cumulative mm. thing with the knock-on effects after it I can't even put myself in that position. I've, I've, I've never had that operation. Hmm. I've been to hospital, but I've never had that operation. So I don't even know what it's like to wake up with that confusion. Never hmm. mind being told all of that after it. Do you know what I mean? Um, 
I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to to, to books and writing. Believe it or not, I actually like writing more than I like artwork, which is mad. Um, I want to give a special mention to Phil Reed, who helped you write the book. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of chapters. I don't know whether you've been told this or <laughs> whether you've not, whether it was intentional. I think it was intentional, but they start by describing what sounds like a, a moment on a battlefield, but then it qu- you quickly realise that you're talking about like a game of footy in the street, or mm-hmm. you you're talking about being at the bar. But you you like draw similarities in the language that you used to being on a battlefield. So you think, fucking hell, he's going to get straight into. Mm. Was that on purpose? Yeah, I mean, I can't take credit for Phil Reed. You know, he's one of my <laughs> best mates, and he's he's, he's that was the first book he's done. Yeah. So it was brilliant for him to get involved in it, and to and to want to take it on as his own. And I think that's what worked so well. You know, Phil, I'd like you know, he's like say he's one of my best mates. We've got similar interests, know a lot about each other, and I think the way he's he's kind of. You know, describe me as a person and all the big things that which I love, whether it's you know being at the pub, being at the match, or being in the Marines, and he's kind yeah. of tried to combine them and give the readers something a bit different where you kind of don't know what's next. And I think that's just down to him again. Massive credit to him. It's his first book, and it was nominated for Sports Book of the Year. Yeah. Um, I think his dad Brian. I don't think he's ever been nominated for Sports Book of the Year, so that's uh, <laughs> that's one for him to have over on his dad. Yeah. And yeah, and it, you know, working with Phil was amazing. It was so therapeutic. I didn't ever think I needed. I've been, you know, touch wood, really lucky. I've never suffered with my mental health with regards to, you know, flashbacks or PTSD to Afghanistan. Mm. So I've never felt that I've needed to talk. But actually when I sat down and, you know, began the book with Phil, it was unbelievable. You know, we'd literally, we'd meet after he finished work. We'd go to uh, Mar Boyles in town. Uh, we'd sit and have a pint, put a dictaphone in front of us and he'd just say, right, tell me about growing up in Bootle. Yeah. And we'd go, f- go on from there. And then as it went on, there was loads of tears, there was loads of laughing out loud. And sometimes where, you know, we'd stop recording, we'd just carry on having this chat. And definitely it was it was great for our friendship and how Phil Lens went away and turned it into a book. It's made it probably the proudest achievement of my life because I felt like I was really honest. You know, I was able to be really honest with Phil. And like you say, he's done a fantastic job in putting it onto paper. Yeah, very good. Very good job. It's it and like, like you said, even though you know what, what happens on the back. Mm. The, the intricacies of what happens in each chapter is like you don't you don't really know what's going to come from yeah. it. So we you, you both did the boss job at that. Um, that was just the geek the geek in me having to. to ah, Philip be made up, but you noticed <laughs> that anyway. Um, moving on, the forward of the books wrote by Jamie Carragher, mm. who was one of my heroes growing up, and and obviously one of yours as well at the time, especially being from Bootle mm-hmm. like you. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of things that he says that you wrote in or that he wrote in the book on the forward he said um when i first met andy he was lying on the couch wearing nothing but his undies <laughs> um, hello lad i said nervously all right cara he croaked back my father-in-law and andy's dad had hatched a plan that i'd go around to see him he was a massive liverpool fan liverpool were flying at the time it was april 2009 manchester united were in a title race with us and the thing that stuck out what what he wrote about yeah is he said he's always trying to push himself. He's always doing something. Come to think about it, he's done more stuff than I have. He's run marathons and climbed mountains. I've never done that. Put simply, no one's going to stop this lad leading the life that he wants to. That, first of all, I've got two questions about that. The first question is, <laughs> I think you've already answered really, what was more painful, that title race, losing by four points to United? Because I remember that Torres, Gerard. Mm, yeah. It was the fucking, the best Liverpool team not to win anything, weren't it? What was more painful, that Klopp leaving or getting blown <laughs> up? Which one was it? Well, I <laughs> remember I was, I was in Afghan at the time with a few United fans and I remember when Rafa had his rant. Yeah. And they were coming up to me saying, oh, crazy. He's, he lost to your manager and I'm like, why, what's he done? Because he got signalled was every few, you know, few days late and, I'm trying, trying to say to me, Dad, you know, what's happened with Rafa on this rant here? You know, everyone's talking about it. My dad's like, his heads fell off. And I'm like, yeah, but what's he said? And, <laughs> and then it just all fell off from there, didn't it? Um, but no, listen, having, having, you know, Carragher become a friend now was brilliant. And that day was just bizarre because I'd not been, I'd been in Afghanistan for maybe five months. Yeah. Then I'd been in hospital for, I think, three months. So I'd not been back to Liverpool in eight, nine months. My first weekend home, I got wheeled into my local pub. And I, I literally look like death warmed up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They just, I couldn't even stand up. I was literally, you know, I'm a bit of an old school fellow like me. Dad, I love standing at the bar. I hate yeah. sitting down in pubs, but I couldn't even stand at the bar. 
So he put me in like the corner of the pub and I hated that, you know what I mean? People just like looking down at me and stuff. And But obviously everyone was lovely trying to buy me a yeah. beer and stuff. But again, I was that sick. I couldn't even stomach the pint. It was like your first pint, you know, when yeah, you're like yeah. trying to have your first pint at whatever age and it just tastes horrible, but you feel like you've got to drink it. That's what it was like. And then the next morning I was due to go back to hospital uh, Monday morning. That's when Jamie, you know, I think he dropped his kids off at school and come in. And like I say, massive Liverpool fan and to have him come in and was just unbelievable. It gave me such a boost in my, in those early days of recovery. And, you know, he stuck to his word. He said, look, you know, you know, here's my number and stuff. And if you ever need anything, you know, and he, he's helped give me stuff that we've raised money for charities for and, and just become a mate who, you yeah. know, being able to go out with and stuff. And as a kid growing up in Bootle, I played in defence myself. He was like my ultimate, ultimate hero. And the fact that like, we became mates is pretty special now. Yeah, it's boss mate. I can't, I can't imagine being mates with your hero. I've met him a few times. I've met him at Gerard a few times, but like glancing meetings, but mm. to actually sit in a room with them, I'd be so starstruck. Yeah. But going back to what he said there, where he said, no one is going to stop this lad leading the life that he wants to. That, that was the thing that stuck out to me the most. And what I wanted to ask you about that is, no one st has stopped you, but getting blown up in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, no doubt changed the course you were on. In terms of mindset, what mindset were you in before you got blown up compared to after in terms of the way you looked at life? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think um, when I kind of get asked questions about mindset and maybe, you know, what... Um, kind of what you see for your life or what you want to get from life. I always bring it back to my mum. You know, I was 12 when my mum died. And I think for me, that that had a bigger impact on me and my mindset than than getting blown up. Because I think, you know, you realise that sometimes you'd have plans in life, whether it's, you know, meet a girl, get married, buy a house, have a few kids, you know, have a dog, have a job in this or that, you know. I learned at 12, my mum passed away with leukaemia. You know, she never smoked, she never drank. One day starts to feel ill, went to doctors, four months later she was dead that for me was a bigger way you could call on life life is just life you know when you've got to kind of make the most of it and that's what made me join the marines you know i, I saw an advert that said 99.99 percent need not apply i wanted to be the 0.1 percent so i think losing my mum always gave me that mindset to want to push on and do things and i guess that's the mindset i had in the marines in afghanistan i had ambitions to go into special forces that's what i would have liked to have seen my career go down you know that path but then when I got up, got blown up, I don't think it changed that much in the sense that I kind of always believed in myself. I always thought, you know, if I've got over the loss of my mum, I can easily get over getting blown up in Afghanistan. And it just kind of made me more determined. And, you know, I've, I haven't read the book in years, so listening back to what Jamie said, I think it probably does sum me up quite well because I think it's almost losing my mum and getting blown up so almost give me a bit of a, a superpower in to know that I feel like sometimes in life I've got like a little bit of a cheap book on life. I think like, do you know what I mean? You can do a lot yeah. in your life, you know what I mean? A lot of the things that people's mindsets kind of, you know, stopped them from even trying. I've always thought, fuck it. You live once, man. Fucking just have a go. Yeah. And like, I'm not I'm not one of these people that don't get embarrassed by failing. I don't get embarrassed about by anything, really. I don't care what people say. I'm just like, fuck it, I'm going to have a go. And yeah. I think those two, you know, hugely difficult events to go through losing me one man getting blown up have definitely made me into a into a better person and, and someone who you know i say to children all the time you know if your dreams don't scare you you're not dreaming big enough it's that whole idea of just thinking yeah fuck it why not yeah yeah that De definitely being exposed to that that hurt and that pain mm -hmm. from a young age definitely sets you up going forward to like you said i can't deal with anyone else mm -hmm. this is the worst thing that is ever going to happen to yeah, you so yeah. Definitely, and it's a good segue, really, because the first chapter in the book is about your mum. It's written about your mum. Um, and you, you say a few things in here. Obviously, she seems like... Your mum and your dad are clearly the most important people in your life at that time. Mm. Um, clearly. Um, and there's a scene that you talk about in the chapter about your mum. And you're at Liverpool's academy and you're playing football and you're in defence and... You make what seems to be just like a simple, you go to make a clearance and your mum's watching your stand, your dad's watching you in the stand and you make just a simple bit of skill in the middle of the park instead of clearing it, you just put your foot on it and the other players go and then you just pass it on. Just mm. a dead simple move and 
you explain that your mum, um, in fact, I'll read it out. It said, my mum raised the right arm of a padded pack of coat and gave me a gleeful thumbs up. Whenever I got low in life, and when I, whenever I do get low in life, I think back to that moment. The the best thing, what you've described about your mum there from the paragraph is that what you did wasn't that special, but she was still proper made up to, to, yeah. to be behind you and celebrating you. Yeah, she probably never had a clue it was a good thing at the at the time. My dad probably had to say to her, you know, I was he's done well there or something. And yeah. um yeah, I think obviously as a kid, I think I was eleven then. Um so probably only a, a year or so before she passed away. Um she obviously just mega proud, like mums and dads are, what whatever the children do. But it's something that, yeah, I think again, going back to my mum, it's always given me that thing to want to make her proud. Obviously wants to make her proud when she was alive, but even more so now there's always that thing of, you know, I never wanted to, you know, in school. I remember my mum when she was sick or when she just passed away. I kind of got a, got away with a lot in school. They'd say, you know, they wouldn't put me on detention because, you know, the, the the head teacher had kind of said, look, you know, give them an easy time. And I kind of got bored of that very quick. I thought, I don't want anyone to ever give me a, a pass in life just because I've had something yeah. bad happen to me, you know what I mean? If if I've, if I've been an idiot, then tell me I'm an idiot. So, And if I've done well, tell me I've done well. So I think just having my mum there or, or in the end not there, not really changed. I always wanted to do it proud, and and there's those memories. Although there's only a few of them, them ones especially are the ones that you know shine bright. But what was what's your best your best memory of your mum? Why, why was you say my mum was boss in the book? Mm. What what made your mum boss? I just think she was just a proper mum's mum. You know, she was um, she was stay at home mum. She had me and my two sisters to look after. So all you really remember, you know, my dad was a firefighter. He was always seemed to be at work from the ages of, you know, up to 12. I can't really remember my dad. You know, it was very old school family. He went out, earned the money, and my mum looked after the house. So I just remember it to be just an amazing, you know, mum. Like, just a great mum. Always there for the school runs, you know, breakfast, dinner, tea. Just having laughs with us all the time, always smiling, joking, just making sure our childhood was fun. So I don't think there's any particular thing I could say. It's just that idea of just always feeling in a loving home. You know, you don't realise how lucky you are, I guess. Yeah. You know, there's some kids growing up, you know, with nothing. And I think my mum just always made just a proper loving atmosphere. And I think that's what probably hurt most when she when she passed away. Mm. There's, um, it's good to hear because uh, a lot of families break up. But my family wasn't wasn't like that. <laughs> it mm. was initially, but it didn't. I didn't. I didn't feel that. Um, I didn't feel like that. You know that makes you makes you feel as a kid you just want to be sort of feel like everything's okay don't yeah, you yeah so i didn't really have that but me, you mentioned there you got a note in school and you and you and you talk about it in the book i'm just going to turn to page 17 so basically um you say that you got um you got a note given to you after your mum passed away by your dad to say that if you ever sort of mm. go off the rails in school that you sort of get a pass. Well, you've seen it as like a pass, mm -hmm. you know, like you let them off with it. <clears throat> I had something very similar to me. My mum was sick as well. But luckily, my mum didn't 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 pass away. But um, I remember being in that same situation during that sickness. And when I was in school, I got into I did go off the rails a bit. And I remember getting shouted at by this teacher, Mister Jones, I think his name was. And he was like, "But I was going to get suspended over what I did." Um, and he basically phoned my mum and then when he found out about the situation he was like didn't know about your mum I'm going to let you off with it don't worry about mm. it and I was like fuck off what do you mean fucking let me off with it like don't fucking pity me yeah yeah is that what you felt exactly, like yeah. if people were pitying you I don't think people ever did but I, I just quickly I think realised in, in, in the in a case with teachers when they were kind of potentially would have would have told me off or would have put me on a bit more of a detention or like you say suspended me or we had yellow cards and red cards it was I definitely thought that like I was getting that off with stuff and and also I wasn't getting pushed as well yeah. you know they were kind of like oh maybe he's, he hasn't got the potential that he wants had maybe we'll we won't be as hard on him and I was like no listen don't you know if I'm gonna be good yeah I'll be good if and, and treat me like I'm good but don't ever you know, um, view me or like say pity me just because of something external that's happened in my life. Do you know what I mean? That was definitely something that like I didn't I didn't want to be associated to me. Yeah. 
definitely. And it sort of it sort of links in with you joined the Marines a few years later. How old were you when you joined? Seventeen. Seventeen. And like you said before, it came from that advert. I remember that advert as well. It was mm. it was a boss advert where it was like a computer game. They've cancelled it now. Have they? Because they said that not a, not as many people. We're all getting were, signed uh, up automatically now, aren't we? So yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, listen. I'm again a bit old school, but I think the whole reason you know you want to be in the Marines is you want to be the best. You want to be. So it isn't for everyone. That that is the point of it. You know, not everyone has what it takes. And I think the advert saying ninety nine point nine nine percent need not apply was making <clears throat> was making everyone think, well, fuck it, I won't apply then. There's no point. Yeah. But it's you know you did get a select group of men who did who did apply, and that's what made the Marines what they are. So I think yeah, through recruitment numbers going down, they've had to change it, make it a bit more. I don't know, a bit more PlayStation generation vibe yeah. and a bit more yeah. So on joining then, you've said a few times there that you joined because you wanted to be that 0.1%. Mm. You'd also say in in your book, you said, I wasn't, bo- I wasn't bothered about rifles or shooting. Some lads clearly were. You'd see the faces light up as they fired off a round. <clears throat> I just fell in love with the people and the, no- and the notion of being uh, actually being a real Marine. <clears throat> I wasn't particularly patriotic either i i understand the the, the wanting to be 0.1 percent but was there a deeper motivation there because the, my biggest fear in life is going to war or going to jail that mm. i'd shit my undies if i had to do either of those things initially did you did you like realize this is actually what i want or was it just more of like the the, the the glorification of the marines what what mm. what, what was it exactly that made you want to join <clears throat> so i went on a, um, <clears throat> i went on to meet the marines day when i was just before i joined the marines when i was 17 and i remember they picked me up in a minibus near the lava buildings in that car park next to the lava buildings and they took us all down to Alka. but i remember jumping in this minibus on a sunday morning it might have been or a saturday morning and i was 17 there was these two lads who were maybe 23 24 young lads absolute units they looked you know in great shape good looking lads like us yeah like us yeah <laughs> um you know chiseled you know just look like almost like a big brother type kind of person um and they had their own language they were talking about they went ashore last night which means basically goes on a night out they were talking about uh going to the bar to get wet in wet, wet as a beer they were saying oh we, we trapped these chicks which means like basically you pulled the girl in the club they had their own little language talking about this night that they had, and it was just, I was just looking at them in amazement to think, wow, you know, they're in their own little world, their own little brotherhood, their own little family with their own little language. And I just thought that sounds like something I want to be a part of. I want to be like them. You're almost, you know, was infatuated by the whole thing. So it, when I eventually did go down to Limston and start me, me training, it wasn't so much like, no, I want to go to war, I want to fight for the queen and country. It was the exact opposite. I just wanted to wanted to be part of this brotherhood. I wanted to have these adventures and have these friendships and have this bond. That was what drew me to the Marines. You know, like I say, I'm not patriotic at all. Um, I don't like the idea of a politician sending you know young men to wars that we've got no place being in. Um, that kind of stuff, you know, didn't didn't apply to me. Maybe that's naive. Maybe that's a bit stupid to think to want to join that because you know that's eventually going to come. But for me. It, that was always, always a second thought. I just wanted to be in the Marines and also to prove to myself to see if I've got what it takes as well. So sort of the challenge of it. The challenge, yeah. You do you do mention that. I thought that the language again was pretty interesting that you used. In in one section you said, I'm going to win. I don't know whether this is just a common language among soldiers or Marines, but you say, I'm going to win that Green Beret. And I thought win is an is a interesting word to use there. Do you see it as a competition? Is this or is that just the thing like winning a cap for England? Yeah, I mean, I suppose winning it was a case of like just me against me. You know, there's a if you like a game, if you like thirty two weeks of training, if you want to treat it as a game, and if you can get to the end of that training by passing all the tests, then you know you've won the game and you've earned a green beret. And that's that you know that's what I wanted. It's it's not something that's easily achieved by many people. I think on average, when I this is back in two thousand and six, I think it was when I joined. There used to be 60 men who would turn up every two weeks. And if you followed those 60 men throughout the 32 weeks of training, on average, you'd only see maybe six or seven who were still there at the end. So you know, it was incredibly difficult 
to achieve. I'm guessing still is now. So I just always, yeah, just treated it as a game. To, I, I want to win. I want to mm-hmm. win this Green Bray. And again, I wasn't really looking at the bigger picture of the likes of Iraq and Afghanistan, which would come on. It was just, I want to prove to myself and I want to be part of this big, big boys club. Do you talk about that when you join? Do other people have the same mentality as that? Yeah, there's definitely like a buzz of being part of this big boys club. Um, and that's just something that's really revered and you, you just want to be part of it. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, a, just a buzz of being with the lads all the time and just, you know, it, honestly, I think if you take out the fact that you've got to go to war, it's like being on a lads holiday. <laughs> yeah. It really is. You know, you're waking up, you know, you're sleeping in dorms together, you're waking up. I'm guessing, well, I, I do think there's a massive link in, in, in boxers and footballers and rugby players than there are in the Marines because it's that locker room environment, you know, you're all, you know, win or lose, you're Being on the booze the team, type thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah just uh, there's a drinking culture there. Everyone loves the gym. Everyone loves keeping fit. Um, everyone loves pushing themselves. There's a real purpose. So you just feel like you're part of like a winning team mm. and it's infectious. With that in mind then, do you think that the people who run the training for the Marines and and whoever the leaders are in that, in those places that you go to, do they do a good enough job preparing you mentally for what might actually happen? Because they must know that kids are just trying to challenge themselves. Yeah, mm. they, they must know there's a large percentage that aren't wanting to just go and fight. Like, oh, I just, because me, I think these kids need to know the reality straight away. So mm. they, do they do a good enough job of telling you that of what could possibly mm. happen? Yeah, listen, I mean, I think they do an amazing job because at one hand they're trying to um they're trying to capture that enthusiasm because you know, they want those type of people to join the Marines. But like you say, at the end of the day when I joined, we were in two two war zones, Iraq mm. and Afghanistan already. So a lot of the training was done by blokes who'd already been out there. So you were getting fantastic first hand, you know, knowledge, advice yeah. and training of what it was actually like out there. And in some ways it made it a bit harder because you'd have corporals taking you through training who had been to Afghan and had lost lads. So then sometimes when you'd be doing a training exercise in the UK and you maybe weren't up to scratch, they were coming down on you like a like a ton of bricks because yeah. they were saying, look, this isn't a game. You know, we've been there. I was there six months ago. I've lost friends because they've done exactly what you've just done then. Yeah. I don't want that to be you next. You know, you need to, you know, really, you know, clean up these skills and drills that we're trying to teach you. So there was a massive emphasis on, look, this isn't just a be part of the big boys club you know you will be going to war as soon as you pass out of training so there was definitely times throughout training where you thought fucking hell like this is real do you know what I mean yeah I think those the sobering thoughts them aren't they as soon as you, you yeah, realise yeah. I think moving on to where you actually did sign up you you put your name down and then you sort of forgot about it and you were just I think you were just playing footy or something and one of the corporals or whatever come up to you and said did you sign up to go to war and he literally told you, didn't he, that it's going to be Monday. Mm. And he said it to you on the Friday. Yeah, so I'd signed up. Basically, they'd asked for the sergeant major a few months prior. I'd asked for some volunteers, and I volunteered. And this was to go to Iraq initially, Iraq, wasn't yeah. it? Iraq, yeah. Yeah, well, it was funny, you know, you'd turn up at company lines, and you'd uh, I'd let your viewers kind of listen to what they prefer, but you'd turn up one morning, and he'd ask for four volunteers, and you didn't know what you were volunteering for. So on the Monday, for example, three people would volunteer. He'd say, you, you and you, you're going to Iraq. He'd be like, right, okay. The next day, he'd ask for some volunteers. You'd put your hand up, you go, you're going to Afghanistan. Okay. And then the next day, you put your hand up and he'd say, you're going to Leckensfield, which is near Hull. And he'd say, you're going on a driver's course for three months. So you'd literally turn up for work and you'd yeah. volunteer. You didn't know whether you're going to Iraq, Afghanistan or Hull. <laughs> and um, <laughs> if anyone's been to Hull or Beverly, it is more so... You'd rather Iraq go to Afghanistan <laughs> or Iraq. It's an absolute shit all. Um, I'm so, sorry for any whole fans yeah, watching sorry. this podcast. Um, <laughs> so literally, so it, and it happened like that for a few months. You know, you'd turn up and you'd put your hand up and you didn't know what you were going to get given. And I'd ends up being on a waiting list to go off to Iraq. And then lo and behold, a few months later, um, yeah, I think it was my troop boss, it was, if I remember rightly, come up to me and just said, um, you know, Marine Grant, you've put your name down to go to Iraq and the spots come up. So you'd be leaving the troop you know, on Friday and you're going down to Portsmouth, you're doing a two week training package and then you're over in Iraq and it literally happened within a few weeks and it's brilliant. I think I was 18 or 19 at the time off to Iraq and it was a really, really chilled out tour though. It was, you know, no real, 
Um, I was never in any real danger. I never had to find my weapon once in anger. It was all about the kind of hearts and minds of the Iraqi people, and it was a, probably a good, a good start-up operation for me to go on, considering I've not been passed out long. And that was in um, is it Umkasia? Um, Umkazar. Um, Umkazar. Um, yeah, so it was a probably like perfect operational tour for someone who'd only been passed out, you know, six, seven months, and to kind of get your feet on the ground. Interesting. You you did you do actually question yourself in the book you said you said like was i really about to go to war you must have been saying oh, fucking hell is this really happening mm. and you say go you obviously you got time to come back and speak to your family about it and you're sitting in your nan's kitchen having a tea with your nan and your dad and your nan's begging you to stay this, this is these this is what obviously you wrote in the book um at that point when you when your nan's begging you to stay and you know that you're going to still go to war like what's running through your mind because if my nan said to me stay i'd be like fuck this war. i'm just gonna go and be a fireman like my dad yeah yeah do you know because that's a challenge as well <clears throat> like did, did that ever cross your mind I think, I, no I, could... I think um i think at that point when i was going to iraq as well i'd spoken to the lads who'd been to iraq and i knew straight away that iraq wasn't a tour that probably people would realize on the news yeah that's another big thing you know you realize when people have got their views and opinions on iraq and afghanistan it's from what they see they, from what they see they don't know or they've not experienced a year long you know i've spent a year of my life in iraq and afghanistan so i know a little bit more than with all due respect me nan did watching Absolutely. the Absolutely. so yeah it was never in my mind to not do it i mean it was a job that i loved and despite me being nervous as well I was proper excited as well, without doubt. Yeah. And the nerves obviously come from you might be killed. Mm. Like that that's that's what and you're also described later on, well, earlier, just before that, about your mate Will, who who unfortunately did lose his life. And it was that in Afghanistan as well. Will Ben. Uh, ben, sorry. Ben Novak, yeah. Ben. He got shot. Um, he was um, so I had a mate Ben he was my PTI in training he was actually from Speak Scouser yeah. he was blown up in Iraq uh, maybe um, probably a six seven months before I was due out there yeah so yeah you, you know, obviously know there's a that there are going to be dangers out there but, but again you, you you just can't you can't kind of get on a plane to go to Iraq and start thinking of all the negative things you know you've got to yeah. be confident in yourself your own abilities the training you've had the lads you're with and you you kind of just put all that to the back of your head, you know what I mean? Until you're writing your will. Yeah, I mean, writing your will is something you don't think you're going to do, <laughs> you know. But again, you just, I think there is something innocent in the sense that you're doing it all together as like, you know, as a young lad. So yeah. there's probably, you know, when you watch it, watch that in a film or something like that, someone writing a will with dramatic music and it makes quite a big scene. I think for me, just something I took in my stride, you know what I mean? Everyone's got to do this. You said you made you one morning, says, right, lads whatever fuck all you've got left in your bank account and whoever you want to have it you know right right that obviously at you know 18 19 just like you can go to me dad that, that was all it was so it wasn't as like yeah probably crazy as probably do you know what i mean so was the is is the safety and the numbers that you you're going with you the camaraderie with the people that you've trained with is, is that where you're getting your not necessarily confidence from we'll probably do get a lot of confidence from the training that you got but is that where your you fear gets suppressed yeah, with, with, I think, you with know, the lads as well. You know, the whole reason you join the Marines because, you know, they are the elite. And the fact that you're now, you know, part of that elite. One of them. You're one of them and you've got all the lads with you as well. It just gives you a massive... I mean, if you're going to relate it to football, it's like, if you're lining up next to, you know, I don't know, Steven Gerrard, Luis Suarez, I don't know, you've got all these amazing players next to you, whatever. But if it's Christian Poulsen... You feel a bit gutted, yeah? Yourself, yeah. So I think the fact that I was surrounded by all these, you know, lads who I looked up to, you know, super talented and had went through what I'd went through, it does give you that confidence to think, you know what? It'd be all right here. Yeah. So moving on to going to, actually going to war, um, I'm just going to read out what you wrote in this chapter. You said, the plane was jam-packed full of Marines with, with steely glares, wearing full desert attire, grasping weapons by their side the sheer sight of it made my heart pound faster this was it i've had time to think on the journey 48 hours long any young man is a, is a long time for any young man to spend on his own company i could taste the dirt in the air when we landed it tasted like nastiness and death this is afghanistan i'm assuming you felt that mm -hmm. just tell us about 
that because that's quite a visceral <clears throat> thing to say it smelled like nastiness and death uh, what did you mean by that how could you sense that i just think there was a there was just an air in afghanistan that this was going to be different than, than than iraq and you felt that from day one i think i felt it even in 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 the training the pre-deployment training we were doing for it you know it was it was just very apparent that this was going to be a tour like no other it was um even on the news there was a lot of lads who were getting injured and killed pretty much daily so you knew you know it was making up the papers on the front page of the papers every day there was a soldier being killed or on on the news so and you knew you know we're going into this place um you knew kind of where you were going actually in afghanistan we i was in a place called fob Inkerman, which was in sangan so you'd kind of done your research on the area and you knew just how kind of alone you were in that spot um and you just knew you were coming up against a formidable enemy in the taliban you know you look through history books and how they how well they've defended their lands and, and what they're about so you knew it wasn't going to be a walkover and i just think all that together and you're looking around at lads and you see a little bit of nervousness here with the lads here and there and stuff and i think yeah there was just a completely different feeling from iraq and afghanistan and the one big feeling i did get from the second when our helicopter landed at fob Inkerman as we took over from the paras and the marines and the paras are kind of like neck and neck if you like behind special forces there's a lot of banter and rivalry between them but i think it's truth be told there's not much separating them a little bit like kind of liverpool and man city is almost saying in today's kind of era you know mutual respect there when our helicopter landed and we all got off the helicopter and walked kind of to go to the base all the paras that we were taking over from were coming back and normally you look at a parody they've got something about them they all just look like you know at like thousand yard stairs they look gaunt they look tired and you know they just finished their six month tour at this place where we were taking over so straight away you got a feeling of like this fucking hell. yeah you know these lads are normally got something about them and they look a bit disheveled and and now it's our job to do whatever you know to finish whatever they'd started almost so that was a bit nerve-wracking to think fucking hell and then you go in and you see the kind of base you're going to be which is just basically a mud hut and then that's when you get into the routine it's straight into it straight being on sanger which is being on watch you're in a patrol kind of diary if you're going on patrol every other day and it's just then non-stop into the ground of war so that that just you want to get there and it's and it you know you want it to be as as safe looking as possible don't you no, there was a big was hole. That? There was a big hole in the wall straight away. You could see from get from, from a bomb from a previous like oh rocket my attack. God. Yeah, so there's like there was the entrance way, <laughs> and then next to it there was just this big massive hole in the wall, and it was just a bit like were they lying to you like oh an elephant run into that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's like that. You know that 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 flag that was like welcome to hell or something yeah. in like Galatas. I just felt a little bit like that. Whoa. And welcome to Afghanistan. You'll be glad to know that this podcast is sponsored by absolutely nobody. But if you do want to support the podcast, go to my own website, which is callionline.uk. There you'll find a range of artwork that I created from football to boxing to F1 to UFC. And you can download my artwork for free as a phone wallpaper for your phone. If you download those wallpapers, you'll also get 30% off anything in store. Every purchase on my website goes towards me being able to put more content out for you, including this podcast. So go and take a look at the collection I've got there and have a boss day. And at that point, were you, were, you full, were you more scared then than you'd ever been? I wouldn't like, say like... The, ever been in, in that I just knew. Concept. I just knew from... I just knew that this was going to be a different tour. I just knew that I was definitely going to be tested. There was definitely going to be moments where I'd question myself and, you know, I just... Yeah, me just kind of... Um, like me spidey senses, if you like, were just on edge thinking this is going to be, yeah, different. Bit of a mad question, but it sort of ties back into the, the being prepared scenario we obviously you were but when you were landing and you know you knew you might potentially have to go and fight what 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 thoughts were you thinking when you were like i might have to kill someone again it's i didn't really think of it like or that i just thought that, that way no you know you're there to do a job and it's never ever you know, from my experience it's you're never ever sitting across like this shooting someone do you yeah. know what i mean you're getting shot at from hundreds of meters away on average um so it's not like you kind of see in the movies and stuff when people like if you killed anyone and stuff like that it's never quite like that and 
So I never really let myself go down that rabbit hole of thinking, what will I, what will I think or what will mm. I act like or what will I do if this situation arises? It was just about, you know, doing my job to the best of my ability, looking after the lads um, and just kind of taking it as it comes really and trying not to think about all the different scenarios that might happen and just try and focus on the on the job at hand really. So because I think it, I think you'd go insane if you started yeah. thinking about what will I do if I see this, if I see this image, if I see that image. And yeah. um, it's just about kind of taking it as it comes really. I think that sometimes obviously we <clears> we <throat> both we both talk about sport a lot because you can draw a lot of similarities in it. And I think about sport, you know, when they do like you know, you picture yourself running the world record at that pace, you picture yourself <clears> scoring the winner at Wembley, you picture yourself knocking someone out. I think too much of that putting it to your scenario there if you think about it too much what am i going to do in this firefight what am mm. i going to do it can sort of paralyze you and go the other way mm. you can have way too much of it um yeah, you do all your training and you've done all your like casualty evacuations and you've you've prepared as best you can but there's just got to be a sense of like take it as it comes as well do you know yeah, what i mean defo so moving <laughs> on to <laughs> obviously the fate the fatal day of where you actually got blown up. It's called Blown Away, the chat there. I read this with like a lump in my throat when I was reading it. I was like, fuck, it's it's mad. But just before you actually go into this chapter, you say about the place that you, you go to, you say reports came through to us via the control room and daily briefings that in other parts of Afghanistan, 12-year-old kids were blowing themselves and coalition troops up in suicide vests. As the moments wore on, Every kid that bombed across the gra the gravel towards us, my heart would stop. That's just so un I can't even comprehend thinking that that obviously you you you'd built a relationship with some of the community there and you were playing footy with some of the kids or whatever whatever you were interacting with them mm -hmm. on some level. When that realization it that <clears throat> fucking at least could be have a bomb. How how did you approach that? It's really hard, yeah, because on one hand, you know, you you can kind of see a vision for Afghanistan and you can see that there are good people there who, <clears throat> you know, just want to be getting on with their own life and you can see, you know, when we forced the Taliban back, you could see villages and areas come to life and you could see people prospering. You think, you want to believe that there are good people there, like, like there are good people there, but unfortunately because of the threat of the Taliban, you have to kind of then second guess everything and keep mm. your distance because of the threat of the suicide bomber, whether that was a farmer whether that was a child, you know, the only difference between a farmer and a suicide bomber is one's holding a pitchfork and one's got a bomb strapped to them. Like, that's, you, you don't know. Um, so it was really, really difficult and it just put your anxiety and your mental health, you know, at, at the wrong end of the scale. Again, always thinking of, you know, what if, what if, and you had to kind of try and get out of that motion of thinking of the worst possible all the time and just kind of take what's in front of you. And it, yeah, it just made it, just made it scary to think there's mm -hmm. so many ways of that you could die here, do you know what I mean <laughs> you could get walk and then you stand on a bomb you could get shot at you could get um the firing rockets at mortars or someone could just run up to you and just blow themselves up so it didn't leave much you know for the imagination it wasn't yeah it's, it's mad it's it's just a, it's such a it's such a situation that you'll never find anywhere else other than in war isn't it there's no yeah. there's no even close situation <clears throat> to being able to describe that like that to me is just it's a completely unique it's like you, you're walking on the line of of life really you're like mm. right on the edge of life aren't you mm. at any moment it's it's i love reading about war and like i love watching war films and stuff like that so you say that though it's quite funny because you know the first time you experience that all your feelings are really heightened and maybe if we'd done this podcast somehow after the first one i'd maybe be able to give it more detail mm. but the fact of the matter is the human body is an amazing thing how it can adapt and overcome and although you might have felt those feelings the first time the first time you've been mortared or rocketed or shot at but once it's happened 30 40 times you get used you're to just it. like oh, fucking hell are you another fucking bomb yeah it, it sounds <laughs> mad but like yeah you're just like yeah. it's just a normal thing yeah which is, which is crazy to think that you can get used to being shot at but you just do mm. it's like when you walk in a if you walk in a room and someone <laughs> someone's had a shit on the desk, <laughs> after twenty minutes you don't smell the shit. <laughs> I don't know about that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I wonder what that smell was. I walked in here. 
it's things of shit but after 20 minutes you can't smell the shit you just become an <laughs> immune, immune to that's it that's one way of describing one it one way yeah. of describing it um, <laughs> so coming up to you getting blown up you're getting actually blown up so before you get blown up I don't know whether it was the day before the morning before your mate mm. as a dream and you sat sat there having something to eat and your mate has a dream about one of your other mates and I thought it was <clears> just funny that you, you mentioned this in this chapter and your mate says last night he had a dream he declared before he cleared his throat and had the clarity Ian in the dream you got blown up pal and she says my mouth dropped open like a draw bitch and said fucking hell lad <laughs> <laughs> I can see that reaction like yeah. what were you thinking at that moment it's like don't fucking say that well we were going on up quite a big patrol to be fair and it was kind of like you know, like, do you know what I mean? Why has he just said that of all of all times? Why has he said that? Now we we were eating a bowl of porridge at like four o'clock in the morning. I had torches on, ready to go out. And although I wasn't leading the patrol, it just it was not great to hear, is it? That someone's had a dream that one was going to get blown up. Um, and you know, I just laughed. I laughed about it. Ian wasn't too happy getting told this from Ryan, but we laughed about it, and you know. How many times have you had a dream you're gonna win the lottery? You, yeah. never, you never do though, do you? So yeah. you can't really think too much into it. But then lo and behold, an hour or two later, that's that's exactly what happened. And is that how close it was? And it was an hour. Well, I'll I'll read the chapter anyway. But the question I wanted to ask you just before you did, it was a routine patrol and you were out in the pitch black. Why did they do routine patrols in the pitch black? Why don't they just do them in daytime? It's so, clearly safer on any level, you'd think. Well, the idea being is that we have night vision goggles and the Taliban don't. Uh, so so there's an advantage we'd there. We'd get out in the darkness, get in position, and then when first light would come, mm. the idea being we'd be basically on the doorstep of the enemy. I see. So, for example, if the Taliban are a couple of miles away and we're patrolling in the in the daylight, they can see us coming. Whereas if we get there during the night, you know, we're, we're pretty much on them already, aren't we? Yeah, makes sense. That's the difference between someone who understands war and, <laughs> yeah. and tactics and someone who doesn't. Um, I'll just read sort of the section where, where, where you said you got, you know, the, the incident actually happened. So you were approaching a ditch and you say the ditch ran aside, was roughly six foot deep and two foot wide. It was a huge trench. Um, it was a huge trench and for some time it acted like a blockage to us, an inconvenience to the patrol. Ian was well aware that at some point we were going to have to cross it. I told him I was right behind him and I'd go whenever he felt was right to do so. Ian came to a halt and we all stopped in our tracks. He was 10 yards ahead of me and I could make out through the shadows that he was probing the ground before him, attempting to figure out where was the best place for us to jump across. Ian turned to me and said, Andy, I'm going to jump here. And without a second thought, I replied, Sam, mate, I'm right here. Bang, bang. First thing I thought was my brain said bomb. That go into more detail about that if you can. I don't really need to say anything about that. But you, from what you remember, what 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 was what? Try and explain that scene as 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 in as much detail as you can if 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 it's possible to do so. Guess yeah, so the idea for the patrol where we were going, um, where we had to go was to kind of get as close to the Taliban as possible. But there was, like say, a ditch in the way. And as walking down this field, we knew we'd have to get over this ditch at some point. So Ian was kind of looking over the ditch and there was trees scattered every few metres. So Ian being the point man, is just looking for a good spot to jump. When he thought he'd found one, he obviously gives me a shout. And it was just a case of me steadying myself next to Ian waiting for him to run and jump, see where he's kind of landed, so I can land in the same spot. And then the person behind me can can do so and so on and so forth. And as Ian's kind of looked at me, I can kind of still see him now. He just kind of looks at me um, and then takes this run and jump. I'm a second later kind of running as well. And I can just remember I have my right leg forwards as it's about to kind of leap over. And then just hearing two of the loudest bangs I've ever heard in my life. And straight away, I just thought, like, shit. I just knew straight away, you know, a bomb had went off. And then I've just started, I fell back and I've just started screaming as loud as I could. Because I knew straight away I'd been blown up. 
and didn't know whether I'd fell into the ditch or whether I'd flown, you know, 20 metres back. And with it being pitch black, I wanted the guys around me, you know, to get to me as quickly as possible. And the first thing I remember really is apparently I'd, I'd blanked out. I mean, to my memory, I'm, I'm awake through through it all. But apparently I'd blacked out for like 20 seconds and was lying on, on the kind of edge of the ditch. And the guys had pulled me out. And there was an army medic who was with us called James Smith, who um, he placed a tourniquet on my groin, which eventually, you know, saved me life. And then the rest of the guys were around me, patching me up, doing everything they could to keep me alive. And how I described that kind of the whole 30, 40 minutes was the first 10 minutes was just in shock, you know, just screaming, saying to the lad, you know, have I still got my arms and legs? And he was saying, yeah, Andy, don't worry, you've still got them. And I was just in so much kind of shock. I wasn't in, I wasn't in any pain to start with, but I couldn't really even feel my arms or my legs. I was just almost lying there like a starfish, weighed down by all this kit in the mud and the dirt, you know, disorientated in shock. I just kept on saying, you know, do, do I still have my arms and legs attached? They kept on reassuring me as best they could. And after about 10 minutes, the pain kicked in. And that's when I, I knew there was something wrong with my right leg. I was thinking, you know, there's something not right here. But again, they kept on reassuring me. And that's when I felt a lot of pain. Like those next 10 minutes was really, really painful. And then the last 10 minutes, I just felt really sleepy. I was obviously close to death at this point. The guys picked me up on the stretcher took me into the open field and was waiting for a helicopter to come in. And they just got to a point where they'd done everything they could with all the resources on the ground. It was just a case of waiting for the helicopter to come in. And, you know, they're talking to me, saying, Andy, keep on talking. But I, well, I've been with them for half an hour now, and it's kind of like, what do you want to talk about? Ah, let's just, come on, you fucking Liverpool of shit. Uh, all right, okay, come on, next. Uh, you've uh, And just thinking of random stuff to talk to you about. And I was just getting really bored and really sleepy and just like, yeah, lads, you, you said that already, you know, boring. And then just, Andy, just fucking keep talking, keep your eyes open. And, and obviously he was just getting really close to death at that point. And then that's when I remember the, hearing the helicopter. And then when I knew the Apache was coming in, that's when I knew the Chinook was coming in. And I could hear they've got a really distinctive sound, the two rotor blades of the Chinook coming in. And I felt like it pretty much landed next to me. And then I just thought, you know, keep keep alive keep awake to get put on this helicopter. They picked me up on the stretcher, put me on the helicopter, and then that's when I don't really remember much from then. They pumped all the blood, drugs, and fluids into me, and next thing I wake up two weeks later. Did you think you were going to die? No, I never really had a moment of thinking that was me. And again, again, I guess that's down to yeah, the lads on the ground. You know, I had loads of confidence in them. I probably didn't realise how close I was to dying, to be honest, only later when I got told that. Yeah, but you'd have been forgiven for thinking it at that point, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I, um, no, but I, I didn't kind of have one, of, have one of these moments where my life flashed before my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I just felt, I felt like the lads were going to get me out of there, which they did. It's good that you were thinking, it, it shows the effect that the other, the, the company that you were in had on you to, to be thinking yeah, that, because you, you had more than just death to worry about there. Because <laughs> you say, um, a split second passed when all I could feel was panic so profound it felt like my heart was going to explode in my chest and then all I could do was scream and scream I kept thinking where are the lads I wanted my dad, I wanted my mum I wanted my mates what if the Taliban get me what if I'm on TV next fucking week on my knees getting me fucking head chopped off that that, that was what was happening constantly. That's mm. why you, you get sent them on fucking <clears throat> mm. on the phone and everything. Was was that the biggest the biggest fear there again? I think when I first when I first got blown up and I knew it was obviously pitch black when I started screaming, they were the initial thoughts thinking I need to make as much noise as possible so mm. the lads know where I am. That was obviously the big fear then. But once the lads got to me and started, you know, reassuring me and started to patch me up then that's when I knew I was gonna be okay then. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's 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 so scary, isn't it? Like this, like you said, there's so many different ways you can die there that it's like it's just and you you, you do a boss job of explaining like the the feelings that you you went through, especially the physical feelings. When, when I was reading it, you say a lot about. In fact, I, I, again, I'll just read it. it. Says your whole body it roared with pain, a tidal wave of prickles and punches, aches and agony surged through me. My body throbbed from palms, from the palms of my hands to the tips of my toes. 
a huge rumble of agony came rushing out of me. The, 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 the way you describe it there, you can actually picture yourself as the person reading it, going through that. Mm. It's um, that's down to Phil. That's doing a good job. Of explaining <laughs> yeah, it. it's Phil. But again, it's 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 you know, it just shows you how because a lot of the times you think when something like this happens, people just forget. Mm. Like I've like I'm not not comparing this at all, but I've like I, I fell out of trees and stuff, and I've blacked out and <laughs> I've hit the floor and I fell yeah. out of a tree. And someone asked me like, "What what were you doing before you fell out the tree?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I just fucking forgot. I blacked out." Mm. You'd think that you would have blacked out in this moment and but you rem- it's still yeah it's i still remember the whole clear to you now 30 40 minutes yeah, really like it was yesterday yeah and it's still clear in your mind yeah yeah and you never you never have issues thinking back to that moment does it ever no 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 I can recall it now that all the times in afghanistan and like say touch wood i've been really lucky don't know whether it's the fact that do the motivational speaking and talking about it all the time but yeah, I'm okay discussing it and thinking back. It doesn't doesn't bother me in that way. It's sort of acting as therapy. Yeah. In your motivational talks, you you you're addressing what happened to you. I think a lot of the time when something bad happens to you, and especially when you're younger, because you don't speak about it, you, you think it's not. Yeah, hurt, yeah. Hating you, but it is. I think because I've kind of took ownership of it now as well. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's I've not let it kind of beat me down and hold me back. I've used it as you know fuel for me fire if if anything. Mm. So, yeah. And then, obviously, you go in, you, you go into your coma, and as we talked about before, you wake up from your coma. And did you do you wake up from the coma back in the UK? Mm-hmm. So you got flew over, and you were in a coma while you f- flew yeah. back. It's just fucking mad, isn't it? Um, and then, obviously, come what comes with that after you've you know what injuries you've got, your, your body's just in in bits, and then you've got to decide to get your leg amputated, mm-hmm. your right leg amputated. The way you describe it, it seemed to me that you were more scared of making the decision to do that than it was to go to war. Well, yeah, because I never, I never chose to go to war. Did I? I chose to join the Marines. The the whole idea of you know getting sent to war was that's down to whoever's in number ten at the time. So I, I never actually chose to kind of go to war in that sense. I actually did have to choose to have my leg amputated because I could live my leg, live my life with a leg that wasn't really. <clears throat> it wasn't 100% anymore. It was obviously badly injured and was going to hinder me in some way, shape or form. Or I could choose to have it amputated. Mm. And hopefully if that operation went well, I could live a life, um, you know, much better than I would have otherwise. So that was the big decision because it's just a very unnatural decision to choose to chop a part of your body <laughs> off. I don't know if anyone's well, ever... Well, it's, it's a decision you think you'd never have to make it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you know, your leg, legs are pretty, you know, good pieces of kit, you know what I mean? Um so it was a big decision and it's also a decision that you know if you decide a week after becoming an amputee that that life's not for you (laughs) you ain't getting it thrown back on do you know what i mean so it it was massive because i think listen if someone had said to me look you've got a you've got a tumor in your 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 little toe we need to chop your leg off otherwise it's going to spread then it's pretty easy decision the hardest bit for me was you know one surgeon would say i think your leg will heal to a point and you'll be able to walk around some surgeons would say you'd be no good with that so it was literally down to me and that was that was the hardest decision i'll probably ever have to make to chop my leg off or not but thankfully it's one that was was the right decision yeah are you all right for time by the way and about the 10 15 sound laughing um yeah i think the, the the fact that you could make the mistake of maybe that was the wrong thing to do cut my leg off where is it more you can just come back or can mm. you? Can you just come back? You can't so much come back in that sense, but I mean, you know, you you know, you've only got a certain amount of time yeah. there, type thing. And it's whereas this was, I guess, and this was on me, wasn't it? You know, I'm making that decision. It's I've got to live with it myself, and it's um, and like you say, you know, you're not coming back from it. It's once yeah. you make this decision, it's final. So that was really, really tough for me to um, because one day I'd wake up and my leg wouldn't be the worst in the world. I mean, yeah, I couldn't run or I couldn't play football and I couldn't climb out once, but I could walk around okay. And I think, you know what? Who cares if I can't run? I'm, I'm I'm quite happy that I've survived getting blown up and who cares if I can't run? But then I'd wake up a day later and my leg would be in agony and I'd think, oh, this is fucking... I can't be doing with this the rest of my life. And, it, and then I'd want to have it amputated. And in the end, I just got fed up with, with not knowing whether it was coming or going. Mm. And I just thought, you know what? Fuck this, I'm having it amputated. Fair enough, fair enough. Do you think it was the best decision now? Oh, yeah, 100%, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, the best decision I ever could have made is swapping on amputated. But it hasn't stopped you doing anything that you wanted to do? No, and I've lived a more fulfilled life from it, you know what I mean? I've I'd never skied with two legs. I've, I've learned to ski with one. I've ne I'd never surfed a day in my life with two legs. I've learned to learn how to surf now. I've been whitewater rafting. I've done bungee jumps. I've jumped out of planes, roller coasters, done marathons, triathlons, <laughs> climbed some of the world's highest mountains. Yeah. All since becoming an amputee, so... Yeah, definitely lived a more fulfilled life. Boss. There's, there's a point where you you do actually question, though, what you went through. You, you know, you were talking about, you think, you think you're talking to other people who were injured at the time, and you say, why are we going through this? You say, I'd never regretted being in the Marines, and I don't think I ever will, but rage consumed me that day as the three of us began to cry together, and Mick lay motionless through it all. Mick, who I think Mick did pass away mm -hmm. eventually. Um, why was my mate dying over a strip of land? Could anyone answer that? Why had it been so important for us to defend this bit of desert in the middle of nowhere? Did it make the country safer? There was no bigger fucking picture. Mm. Later that day, mixed machines were turned off. Do you do you have answers to those questions now? No, and it's probably only that and one other time is probably the only other time I've, I've thought about it. And the only other time, apart from that day, was when... You know the withdrawal happens from Afghanistan when you've seen on the on the news the British and American soldiers leaving Afghanistan, and you kind of see people hanging to planes and things like that. That was probably the only other time I've questioned the time in Afghanistan, and I just think it's you know there's no real you know easy answer or quick answer. The fact is, you know, were we right to be in Afghanistan? Who knows? Were we right to occupy the land for so long? Probably not. Uh, could we have done a better job in strategically just going in and out? Maybe, I don't know, guessing so. But it was just really hard that day to see uh, Mick Lasky, another scouser, you know, lie there motionless, waiting for his, his poor dad to turn the machines off. And it's on days like that when you're sitting there holding, you know, you, you know your mate's hand, or you, I think I have my hand on his leg. You're thinking, like, what were we doing in Afghanistan? You know, whether we... You know, whether we were fired enough to telephone from this compound or that compound, how was that affecting people in the UK? And that's the thing when you start getting angry and you start thinking, why are these politicians, you know, sending us to war doing that? And then again, the other time is when um, Afghanistan pull out and you just think of all the good work that was done and all the... I think because I'm a father now, I've got my own daughter, you think of all the poor kids who won't have the education that they might, might have, would have uh, possibly would have. Um, so... No, I've not got the answers to, you know, whether it was right or whether it's wrong. But it, it's just only on days like that where your emotions can kind of fire up again and you start questioning it. And I think for me, if I'm going to kind of give a, an answer how I feel about it, you know, Afghanistan today doesn't doesn't consume my every thought. I very rarely think about it. If anything, if I was going to put my life down to anything now, it's to try and live my life to the fullest. So the likes of, you know, Mick, who was, you know, wasn't as lucky as me, I can kind of live my life through him. Do you know mm. what I mean? Because... There are a lot of lads who, who didn't come back, you know, Ben Novak, Mick Lasky, with two people I knew personally. You just, I just want to kind of live my life to the fullest now because there's people who can't. Did do they do mean? anything to swap places with you if they could? Exactly, exactly. Mm. And I know the families would want them here as well. And you just got to try and realise how grateful I am to have been to a war zone, two war zones, get back from it, you know, safe and sound, albeit missing a leg. But listen, there's a lot more worse people off than me, so... Just got to try and make the most of it now. Speaking of gratitude, moving on to one of the last chapters of your book, Alba, mm -hmm. your daughter. You had Alba, um, obviously you got told that you couldn't have kids and the, your partner at the time went through IVF and you mm -hmm. had Alba. Again, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. Um, is she the best thing in your life? Yeah, 100%, yeah. And the reason why it makes it <clears throat> all worthwhile getting blown up I always say to her all the time, you know, <clears throat> I think I, I could joke with her and I say, like, you know, you're the only person in the world that's worth getting blown up for, you know, because <laughs> if I never got blown up, I wouldn't have her. So just if there's one thing, one person, one moment that makes getting blown up in Afghanistan worthwhile, it's 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 Alba. Um, and, you know, I call her my little miracle baby because, again, being told you can't have kids was absolutely heartbreaking and coming from someone who... Grew up in a real loving family, you know, and then that family got ripped away when I was 12 and the family dynamics changed when my mum passed away. 
I always wanted to have a big family, have kids and have that loving household again. And at 20 to get told you can't have it was absolutely heartbreaking. And uh, when I met my partner, Leonie, and um, she had two kids already, then we added to it with Alba. It was just, was just the best thing in the world. It was, um, again, so lucky that IVF worked. And then to have her there, and I'm afraid just to kind of just take it all in a stride. You know, she's nine now and she just grows up thinking that, you know, I'm completely normal with one leg and, you know, we've got such a great relationship and she knows all about me and the Marines and Afghanistan. And I think if anything, it's given me um, the better ingredients to be to be a better father, mm. to, to know that, you know, I'm hopefully setting a shining example to her, to know that life won't always be easy, but hopefully she can see what I've achieved and she can kind of realise that, yeah, it won't be easy, but it's doable. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And it's, oh yeah, she's without doubt the best thing that's ever happened to me. Good. Has she read this book? Or is she too young? No, not yet. Yeah, yeah, she's a bit too young at the minute, but she's really bright. She loves reading, so no doubt, you know, she will read it one day, which should be... Um, well, she, when she does read it, she'll she'll obviously appreciate this um, little chapter that is called Alba. And I've highlighted just the, the opening of that chapter. It says, if my mum hadn't died when I was 12, I wouldn't have joined the Royal Marines. I was a sensitive kid who cared more about collecting footy stickers than lifting weights with spaghetti arms in front of my bedroom mirror. I took a little bit of offence to that because I, I do that. <laughs> um, I was born idle. If I hadn't joined the Marines when I was 17, I'd never have been blown up in Afghanistan. I'd never have suffered 27 injuries and would never have chosen to have my leg amputated. I'd never have suffered the suffocating sadness of being told that my testicles had to be cut off, cut out as a result of the blast. I'd never had to stomach the feeling of waking up each day feeling worthless. But if I hadn't gone through all that, then my little Alba would never have been my Alba. Yeah, it's, some, um, it's a lot to go through to have to, to have her. But again, you know, I wouldn't change it for the world. She's, um, yeah, she's everything to me. And, and, and yeah, I really would go through it all again for her because... Um, you know, anyone who's got kids and especially what you've had to go through to, to, to have her, it's amazing. And yeah, again, I, I think because of her, I think that's one reason why I've, n I've never, again, touch wood, had any kind of crazy meltdowns from Afghanistan and stuff and I've not got any major issues with it because, yeah, I got blown up. Yeah, I've got one leg, but fuck me, how lucky am I? Like, I feel like the luckiest fella in the world because of Alba, even if I'm just going to pick one thing. Um, and I guess you know it's, it's I think it's an old Chinese saying is they it's like you never really know if you if it's a good thing or not unless it's run its course. Mm -hmm. If anyone would have told me at the time, listen, mate, you're getting blown up Afghanistan, you're going to be flying. I would have thought Are you messing. I'm lying here, mm -hmm. all these injuries, etc. Me <coughs> career over, you know where's the where's the positives in this? Yet on the third of February. You know, this year, twenty twenty four or twenty twenty five, sorry. Um, it's fifteen years since I got no we're in twenty twenty four, aren't we? Twenty four now, yeah. Sorry, yeah. So third of February twenty twenty four is fifteen years since I got blown up. And like I just feel like I just so lucky for the things I've achieved, the things I've done. And if anyone had said to me, you know, I would have thought they were insane at the time, but as as I may now, fifteen years later, looking back at all the things I've done then yeah, getting blown up in Afghanistan was a good thing. It was a positive. And a lot of that positivity and you know, all that comes down to Alba. So yeah, I'd hate it if anyone ever felt sorry for me. I'd hate if anyone ever, you know, going back to my mum gave me that pity to think, oh, you know, listen, I've, I don't need your pity. I've, I've, I think I've done all right now since. And a lot of it's down to those foundations my mum laid or my dad carried on, my sisters. And now Alba's continuing now. Mm. So going, going back to, we'll, we'll close off now. Going back to... I want to just do a thought experiment, which you've said a few times, it, af, getting blown up in Afghanistan could potentially be looked at as the best thing that's ever happened to you, but a lot of people would think it was the worst thing that had ever happened to you. Mm. If you could go back to that night now, and you walk and you see the ditch you see Ian ahead of you, and obviously, instead of not seeing it, you're doing that moment again, but this time you see a tripwire or you see a bit of metal in the floor and you know it's a bomb, do you stand on it again and go through everything you went through, all that pain again, to be where you are now? Or do you avoid it and risk your life turning out differently? 
No, again, just because I've got Alba. You know, I wouldn't have Alba. You know, that's a fact. I wouldn't have to. I wouldn't have had to go through IVF. I wouldn't have met my partner at the time and go on the IVF journey. You know, I wouldn't have. Everything would have been different. And if even if just one thing was different, I, I wouldn't be sitting here now. So for the fact that I want to have Alba in my life, I'd, I'd step on it every day of the line week. Line it up again, Osama. <laughs> yeah, line it up again. Give me two this time. It's um, I'd, yeah, I'd do everything again because. That's that's a mad thing to say, isn't it, though? It is, but I can't imagine my life now without my daughter. Do you yeah. know what I mean? She's the most important thing to me. Um, and, yeah, and and besides my daughter as well, I just obviously I do it all for that, and you can kind of end the sentence there, but mm. everything else in my life, you know, I'm in a very fortunate position where I'm a, I'm a motivational speaker. I'm going around delivering motivational talks to young children in primary schools, big businesses. I've spoken in China, in America, in Europe, I spoke to the England football team on the brink of a World Cup. I've, you know, I hopefully had, you know, massive impacts on, you know, everyday people's lives when they hear me speak. Um, I've got a great relationship with my family, my friends. I'm healthy. I, I've got not got much to moan about, really. So despite the one leg and getting blown up, I'd do it all again in an instant if, if it meant I am where I am today. Boss, powerful message, mate. So life now. What's next for, for Andy Grant? What, what's next with the podcast, with the motivation you What's the... What, I think it's always a bit of a... goal now? It's always a bit of a downplayed answer, really, because just more of the same. I sound a bit like maybe John Lennon, you know, when he says, the teacher says... Um, what did he say in the teacher or something? Um, about life or something, he says, I want to be happy. Oh, yes. Yeah. He says, uh, you didn't understand the question. Yeah, he said, yeah. you don't understand life. <laughs> I just want to be happy. Yeah. You know, we started, there's a lot of the... That, that podcast then it's about you know kind of death and sadness and adversity and what i've learned through all that is you know we're only here once <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. i mean you get such a short go at it some shorter than others i've learned to appreciate it and enjoy it and i'm i'm just here for a good time i want to be a good dad i want to have you know i want to travel the world with my daughter with my loved ones i want to have experiences i want to laugh i want to cry i want to just experience things um, and just more of it all there's no real big crazy goals at the moment I'm sure there will be but just keep doing what I'm doing I've got a podcast that I enjoy doing where we talk about sport every week um, having people reading the book and getting enjoyment from that and doing the speaking and yeah there's no it's real more of the same. just more of the same really yeah more of the same keep on enjoying my life and yeah well that's it mate nice one for coming in no hopefully that was alright for you cheers um, and once again anyone who's watching the book and this book is called You'll Never Walk. It's a it's a great book. I know I went through some things highlighted there, but you need to go into the detail to see how powerful the story actually is. So, yeah. Where can they find it, and where can they it's find you? It's on Amazon, but I've, like I say, I've got some spare copies, so if you message me on Instagram, um, I'll be able to sort it. I'm watching Instagram. Andy G. Bootneck. Happy days. Nice one. Nice one.